पुष्किन Back in 2008, Al Doan and his siblings helped their mom open a quilt shop in Hamilton, Missouri. We fixed up the building and we we got it all set up and then mom was ready to start quilting and we opened the doors and there's nobody. Opening a quilt shop in a town of 1000 people, uh it's not it's not as cool as you're imagining. Since then, Al's mom, Jenny Doan, has become a huge quilting star on YouTube. The family has turned Hamilton, Missouri into this like Disneyland for quilters, and their quilt shop, the Missouri Star Quilt Company, has grown to over a hundred million dollars a year in revenue. I'm Jacob Goldstein, and this is What's Your Problem. My guest today is Al Doan. My name is Al Doan, and uh, I work for the Missouri Star Quilt Company. Uh, what are you now, chairman or something? Were you trying not to say chairman? Oh, I am the yeah, yeah, okay. My name is Al Doan. I'm the executive chairman of the Missouri Star Quilt Company. The Missouri Star Quilt Company sells quilting supplies on the internet. Squares of fabric, batting, sewing machines. But the story of the company is not really about quilting. It's about how to combine low-tech and high-tech to build a wildly successful brand. So I'll, uh, I'll I'll tell you the the story starts with me long time ago. Uh no, it actually it starts with my mom and my mom's a cool mom. Like she's she's great. Mom's mom's a big goofball, right? And she, like she's the funnest mom to have because everything's everything's fun and a game to her. Like we were broke our whole lives, but I never knew it because it was always let's see what we can get for $28 at Food for Less. We're all right, uh-huh. kids, go look and we're going to find it like So we come out with like with like nothing but but for us it was the great adventure and off we were going. Uh-huh. And so that's sort of mom's style, right? Is she's just everything's a game, everything's fun, everything's an adventure. And um uh, and so like when when I'm in business with her now, uh that's a great person to have by your side when you're trying to figure it out, right? And when we started doing this quilt company, uh we started this quilt company and it was, you know, it wasn't supposed to be the quilt company. It was supposed to be a cute little side business to help mom pay for the house cuz dad was working for the newspaper and we were all afraid he was going to lose his job, which which uh if he would have stayed there, he he definitely would have, right? What was he doing at the paper? He's a machinist. And so uh he worked yeah he worked for the Kansas City Star just fixing presses and stuff and like my parents were terrible with money uh they well I don't know if they were terrible with money or they just never had any money but it sort of went hand in hand and uh and so we started this company just thinking hey it'll help mom uh mom can chip in a few bucks to help pay for the house and because it was such a low impact effort um we were actually able to start it otherwise I like if we needed revenues and monies and stuff all put together to get into this we would have never done it we, we shouldn't have done it two questions what were you doing for your day job at the time and like why quilts uh so i came out of college and took a job with the semantic corporation so i'm like a a nerdy tech guy i really like that space and then in 2008 uh they they fired or laid off me and 20,000 of my closest friends and uh for the first time in my life i was without a job And then why quilts? So my mom took up quilting when all us kids left, right? When you're used to seven kids at home, you got a lot on your plate. And all of a sudden she found <laughs> herself with nothing to do. And mom went over to the Votec college, in, you know, next town over from us, and they were doing a class on like making a log cabin quilt. And she just fell in love with it. It's an it's an art form, right? It's an expression. It's all the great cool stuff. And then at its core, you're making something to keep you warm, which is this very practical thing. And so uh I called her one time and she'd been making these quilts and she'd taken one into our local quilters and and when I say when I say a quilter this is the person when when you make a quilt you sew a bunch of pieces of fabric together and you have a very thin big piece of fabric now and the quilting the process of quilting is taking that fluffy middle stuff we call it batting and then the backing and you sandwich all that together and stitch around it so it doesn't come apart and that that process we call quilting And so she took her quilt in to get it quilted and which uh, is like the last step and you need a machine or something that yeah. your mom didn't have for that? Yeah, it's a big like $40,000 sewing machine. It's got a big throat on it so we can get all the way into the quilt and do all that stuff. Okay. And so she took it into this lady and the lady said, "Great. I'm backed up about a year. I'll get it back to you. We'll see see in a year." And I was like, "Man, 
There is nothing on this planet Earth that needs to take it. You, you can build a house in eight months if you want to. Uh, so she's, she was relaying this story to me. And I said, if I bought you the machine, could you do this? She said, yeah, I think I could figure it out. And I uh, called my sister. That, and like that was my market research. And so you bought your mom the machine? Did it work? I mean, was that step yeah, well, one? Yeah. Of- <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, we did. We bought mom the machine, uh, you know, took out a second mortgage on my sister's house because she had, she had assets. I was still single and had nothing to my name at the time. And because we're in the middle of nowhere, right? Like your world doesn't have this up, up in real cities. But out here, we bought an old 5,000 square foot auto showroom for $24,000 and then a quilt machine for $36,000. So for a total mortgage payment of like $400 a month, we had a full business ready to go. And uh, we all, all the kids chipped in, like we fixed up the building and we, we got it all set up and then mom was ready to start quilting. And we opened the doors and there's nobody, right? There's, it's, it's sort of a very underwhelming opening a quilt shop in a town of a thousand people. Uh, <laughs> it's not, it's not as cool as you're imagining, but, uh, but we, we launch and, and, uh, so we had this cute little quilt shop on the side and then I lose my job shortly thereafter. Right. And, uh, and I had this idea in the back of my head that I loved around a daily deal for quilters. Right. And so it, and so daily deals was, it was a thing back then more than now, right? Like what was today to only, the right? It's like yeah. the dailiness of it is right now, one day only get this great deal on this thing. I'm 25 and I was super hooked. Like I loved them. And, uh, but nobody had ever built one for my mom's demographic. There was no one that was doing this for 40 to 70 year old women that were into quilting. It was all like outdoor gear, tech gear. It was basically like the, the tech kids, tech bros who would build these sites are selling stuff essentially to themselves. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And nobody had built and marketed and messaged to that to that group. And so I was like, man, this would be cool to try. When I lost my job, I said, well, we got this cute little quilt shop at home. I wonder if I could take it online. So we built uh, we built an e-commerce store for it. And uh, and we did, we, we put it all together, launched this daily deal site. Uh, and again, just crickets, right? Like I didn't, <laughs> launching a launching a site to nobody is hard. We didn't have an audience. We didn't have we didn't have a customer base yet. But we we got it out there and uh, just started building this email cadence uh, to our list of people that were that were uh, you know growing it to a hundred people and a thousand people slowly and uh, and marketing this daily deal that was happening every day and leaning into that as our sort of commerce hook and uh, and. It started picking up steam. It wasn't uh, not almost any fault of our own, but uh, you know, it started picking up steam. And the things that we were trying to do were uh, figure out where we could find this audience. Because I mean, it's funny that the market research says there's 12 million quilters in America, and okay. uh, and on Facebook, with all of my parameters wide open, I could find about two million of them. Right, which okay. which you go back to 2008 they just weren't even like they didn't have an email address. That was something a lot of my customer service people would have to help with. You had to have an email address to order from us. And they were like, well, Judith, let me sign you up for a Gmail account. And this is what it's going to do. And we can get you all set up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like finding, finding those people was, was a little bit of an art form. And, uh, and so that's where a lot of my attention and interest went uh, after that, because we knew if we could get them to our site, like they love a deal, they love a deal. And, uh, and if I could put them in here and show them the experience we'd built that we'd win. I mean, at, at some, like the simple abstraction of it is like, there's all this stuff happening, daily deals and e-commerce and it's growing and Facebook ads. But it's not happening for this giant segment of the population, right? It's not happening for basically older women, right? Is that essentially your customer base? Yeah, yeah, that's ex- that's exactly right, right? Like, like, I mean, uh, um, and there's a bunch of demographics that still live in these spaces where, like, nobody is bothered to build a great experience for them. And uh, you know, I I was I was plunking around with like stained glass window making. My grandpa makes stained glass windows, but he's he's too old to teach me. And like nobody's sat down and said, "How can I make this experience amazing for a beginner and great to get into?" And how do I how do I continue to support them as they keep going? And like, I mean, you can go industry to industry, uh, and and so many of these have been overlooked. If you just sat down and said, "Can I make a great experience around this?" You would be ten times better than the incumbent sitting out there making most of the money. Well, in terms of the great experience, I mean, it seems like one big early move 
is getting your mom on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So well, well, getting mom on YouTube. So this was, this was 2008 that we started going into this, right? And uh, we started putting to, to, together tutorials that were just like, how do you make a quilt? Um, and putting them up on YouTube. And I was recording mom and I'm a 30 year old bearded man at that point. So I knew nothing about quilting still. And she would, she would try and record these, these tutorials. And because I'm behind the camera, I got to be like, mom, I have no idea what you're trying to say. Like, I know you think you're teaching how to quilt, but like, I'm your audience, explain it to me. And so as she got making these tutorials, she had this very approachable feel to her, which, which even today, man, very few people are teaching like the instinct is to go and teach the quilter that already knows how to quilt because that means you're a good quilter. And so to, to teach in an approachable way that anybody can pick up and watch this and uh, and then join into the clan is uh, is a very rare thing. And so she started going in the early days of YouTube. That became our entire messaging lever, right? We, uh, we started an email list that was just sending out this video and saying, Hey, we released a tutorial. You'll love it. And that was, that was it, right? Like they already, they knew we had the daily deal. They knew, and we'd put some of that in there, but, it, but like, it was very little buy, buy, buy. And, and a lot more like, uh -huh. Hey, we did this thing for you. We think you'll love it. And it grew like our, our marketing list grew to hundreds of thousands. Now it's millions of people. And uh, back in the early days when I was running the day to day, it was like 73% open rate. Right today, it's like fifty six percent open rate. It's Which still an absurdly charge, high amount. Right? Yeah, yeah. Is it right that your your mom broke her leg when you were making a first video? <laughs> I got is it that on a video. So, so, no, no, no. So this is definitely real. And so we pull out this camera, and I'm like, "Mom, just give me give me a tour of this of the shop." She's like way over the top and doing like little leg kicks and song and dance. And she goes by the quilt machine, which has a big cord that runs from the machine down to the computer that runs it, and got her leg tangled. And just like I'm recording, da da da, da and then just boom, she's down. And and like I thought she was just being overly dramatic, right? And uh, so me and my sister are like get up, mom. She's like, "I think I broke my leg," and I'm like, "You did not break." your leg. Uh, you're fine. And she's like, no, I really, I really did. And, uh, and so I was, I refused to let an ambulance come to our new little shop. I just thought that would be bad for uh, business. And so finally she, we load her up into the car and drive her to the clinic. And, uh, they're like, yeah, it's broken. And so about, I don't know, four or five months into this business, mom's holed up in her bed. And, uh, my sister, Natalie, who was also working for no payment at the time, was like, well, you got to learn how to run this because we've got to be putting out this product. So, okay. So you got your mom on YouTube, you got the daily deals. I mean, honestly, things, things start going and like, we're growing at about 200% a year. Um, in, in the early okay. days, we went, we went a hundred thousand to a million to 4 million to 8 million to 13 in, in million annual in revenue. revenue. Annual yeah. And it's just, it's yeah. just going up. Right. And, uh, and it's and, going and up like, because like, I mean, that sounds great. Is it super hard? I mean, is it hard even to finance? Like, do you have to buy the fabric before you sell it? Is it, are there moments when you're jammed up in there? Like, are there particular? Yeah. No, the, I mean, this, the, moments? the tough parts about this are, are definitely the finance. We were bootstrapped. Nobody was putting money into a quilt company. Um, and so we're, we're like financed off of the very safe space was, was when we were buying things and I could just pay it off with my credit card if things went bad. Right. But pretty soon we, we outgrow that and we're starting to talk millions of dollars of inventory that we need to hold. And the way my industry works is, is you've got to buy fabric six months before you get it. So you look at it and, and they say, we're going to print this. We'll have it in six months. How much do you want? You place your order for, say, a million dollars worth of fabric, right? The, yeah, yeah. So when we would get the product, we owed the money. And we had to turn that product into dollars in that first 30 days because we couldn't afford to pay for it otherwise, uh -huh. right? And so we have to immediately turn that inventory into money to cover our, our cost. And all the while, you're growing at 200% year over year. And so when I place the order to when I'm going to uh -huh. sell the, the fabric, I need to plan for hopefully double the amount of customers. I think, I think they're going to show up. Yeah. And then as you're holding it, <laughs> double the customers again. And I hope they show up because if not, I'm stuck with all this inventory and nobody to buy it. And I've, and I've killed my entire business. We literally, I've, it felt like we were betting the farm every three months. So when do you buy the town? 
where you started. Somewhere along the line, you wind up sort of buying up most of the downtown in this <laughs> town where you where you live, right? Yeah, I feel like I maybe buried the lead here. We we did buy the town. Yes, uh, the, 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 that's such a fun part of the story because we're in this small town where where uh, we grew up, Hamilton, Missouri, and we bought just this old auto showroom off the off the main street to start. And then about a year or two in, the this family in town was selling their they had an old antique shop there, and it was right on the main drag. And we said we should get that. Um, actually she came to us and said, you should get this location, location, location. So we, we go in and we buy this old, um, antique store and, uh, you know, it's like paneling on the walls and eight foot ceilings. And we, we remodeled it. We pulled everything out, all the asbestos siding and, uh, and, but like we, we remodeled this into this great, cool space and, uh, and then turned that into our quilt shop. And now we have this quilt shop on main street. But as we kept growing our inventory, we had more and more um, need for space. And so we bought another small building, an old salon, a hair salon, and turned that into a quilt shop and split out a, a theme of fabric. It was like Christmas and holiday stuff went over there. And then we filled up again, right? This this 5,000 square foot shop of ours, it just filled up with fabric again. And then we bought the next one and moved batik fabric over there. And so that's why we started and continued to lean into it, even to the point where once we got three or four quilt or, or different shops open, um, I was Googling around, like I wanted to know who had the most quilt shops of any town in the world. And it was like some town in Germany had four, right? And it, like, it's not a lot. And I was like, man, what if we got to say, what if our marketing shtick was we have the most quilt shops of any town in the world? Like that's worth pulling off the highway for. Let's be that. And so we we leaned into this, right? It was sort of happened by by happenstance, and then we realized that we had this really great thing on our hands, and uh, and leaned into it. Now we're fourteen quilt shops, and uh, we have three restaurants. We have a sleep and sew sort of retreat center that you come with your girlfriends for a slumber party and spend a week. And we have uh, we have a man's land where you park your husbands. They sit and watch uh, you know sports and play pool while your wife shops, and like. We have all we built this entire experience around it that sort of stemmed from uh, the fact that we had cheap real estate here because nobody's opening commercial enterprises, and two that uh, that like we we were willing to go through and like build uh, an experience that nobody had ever really done before. It, it's not a big box; it's like a town that we sort of cobbled together into this thing. It's cool. And how much of well, how how big is your company now in terms of revenue? Uh, we're, we're north of a hundred million. We, uh, we, we get up there a little bit. It's fun. It's about 400 employees. Uh, we're, yeah, it's full time. How much, how much of the revenue is from people coming to your town? Uh, about eight, about 8 million, I'd say. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not like it's, it's somewhere around 5%. It's not a ton. And, uh, but like it's, it's meaty enough that like, it, it represents such a small chunk of revenue, but it's like an outsized, like 90% of our marketing message is built around this town and, and the people here and the customers coming. Right, right. Well, and your mom, right? So instead of being just some like random place where the fabric is cheap, you've got like your mom, who's an actual person yeah. in this actual town in a real shop. Like, it seems like that is a huge part of the of the the town that you have bought and of your mom, right? It's like a real place and real people yeah i mean mom mom is our mickey for sure right which is which is <laughs> tough because like i mean i always talk to her i'm like nobody lets you know sleeping beauty have a bad day at disneyland you've got to be on you're smiling you're happy uh -huh. Uh -huh. and you know for 13 years you gotta really shine keep going um i mean we get such distance out of this online because you're not buying from a faceless warehouse you're buying from us you know us. You can come and talk to us. You can come give us a hug. You can come out and visit. And uh, you got a question, like we'll we'll come and chat with you about it, which it, which you don't have in most businesses. Amazing story and so fun. We didn't even get into any problems, but we will in a minute after the break. Now, back to the show. So, okay. So congratulations on all your success. Congratulations <laughs> Thanks, to your Ed. mom. 
Um, but I'm curious it's, it's, about. It's cool, right? It's interesting. It is cool. No, it's a it's a wonderful story. It's a happy story. I'm happy for you and your family. Uh, but I'm also curious. I mean, like, what are you pushing on now? So what we're working on now, let's see, there's probably two or three things that I think are, are super interesting. One, we, we bought a second town <laughs> because once you have one, the, the first thing you want is a second town. So seven miles to the south of us is a town called Kingston and it's population 300 people. And they literally have no revenue, right? There's no budget for the town. There's nothing there. Um, it's, it's just a few houses in our county courthouse. And then I'm trying to like get the Missouri Department of Transportation to let me do a run walk trail. And my wife's building a, uh, you know, we're putting in like a, like a rec center because out here, you know, it's not, the the culture isn't built around fitness and health and stuff. And so there's a lot of distance still to go on that and to convince people to move out here. We have a lot of, of branding and messaging to do around that. The challenge inside of that is like, we need more warehouse employees. We're probably 50 employees short of where we need to be. Okay. And so we're trying to solve like the housing challenge here which is there's been no new development since the 70s and nobody really wants to develop here because why would you? And so me and my sister, I'm like, I'm, I'm like trying to build a subdivision and I'm Googling where do roads come from? How do, how do street lights happen? You know, that kind of stuff. Just trying to stumble through it. So that's so like the physical, the physical in-town retail, like multi-town experience stuff, I think is super interesting. I, I really like that as an opportunity. Um, I like it because it's a little bit harder, but but like, there's no saturation in that branding message, right? Like if you heard somebody somebody bought three towns and turned it into a quilting trifecta, like it's just more interesting and everybody's not doing it. So it's worth going to see. Okay. So uh, buying slash building another town, that's one of the one of the things you're working on. Uh, you said there were two. What's what's the other one? I mean, I'm, I'm just chewing on what content looks like uh, for for my industry in the next iterations, right? Like if you think about content, I think about in three buckets where there's like education, entertainment, and inspiration. And we got inside of education, you know, there's like a thousand different ways to do education content. And we picked 10 minute tutorials for quilting. And like, we have nailed that, Mm -hmm. but there's the 50 other ways that content can be done that like we have yet to address or build into. And that's the other thing that like, I think is, is a huge opportunity and worth us staring really hard at. I think we should own, you know, the 20 minute, if you're into quilting, what do you watch while you're sitting on the treadmill on Netflix, right? It's, it's that uh-huh. kind of stuff. And I'm like, uh-huh. man, we, we would kill that. I want you to tell me a story of something where you screwed up, something went wrong, something didn't work. I mean, I'm sure there's a million of those. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, I mean, I've got two big failure stories that I think of when I think of what we, what we've done here. Right. And the first one was when we, we built a warehouse and we built a, we built our first warehouse. We did everything out of our 5,000 square foot auto showroom. That was our warehouse, which, which it's easy to organize. I mean, you get a lot in there. It was a lot going on, but for a big company that was sent, I think we were like 30 million a year before we moved out of there. I mean, we had a lot of inventory and no, no forklifts, just our poor guy Ammon was just moving stuff. Um, so, so we built this warehouse and I was like, I was too cheap to know that you're supposed to hire like partners and consultants to help you do this stuff. And so I just, I found the only guy that like would build off of my notepad drawing and didn't stress out about like not having blueprints. Cause I was like, it's a big box. And he's like, well, where do you want the toilet? I was like, do a wall that's 10 foot here and it'll be lunchroom and toilet and all that, you know, like I'm just trying to solve it in two minutes because I had a thousand other things going on. So anyway, this guy builds a warehouse and uh, simultaneously I had built all the software. Like we had a little team. It wasn't me alone, but like we built all the software for this company. And so we had to build this new fulfillment software now again, because I, I thought that we were so unique and so custom that we couldn't get anybody like we couldn't go and buy a thing off the shelf and pay somebody to do this. We had to build it ourselves. And then like I order the, the racking, right. The pallet racking. And, I, and they were like, Hey, for $10,000, we'll set it up. And I was like, ah, I'll save the 10 grand. I'll set it up myself. I know how to do that. So we get this pallet racking. me and dad are there till three in the morning. And then I, we also, we had a hundred computers we had to set up in there for shipping stations, all this stuff. And I'm a computer guy. I know how to do this. And so I'll order it, put it all in there. And, uh, and then the big day comes and we go to move everything over and everything breaks and it like, it's a disaster. And we're like completely down. 
we can't ship orders. The phone, like we've got 8,000 tickets in our email. The phones are ringing off the hook. Nothing works. And, uh, and it was terrible. And I stuck around for like two days. We tried, you know, we get it cobbled together. They're almost getting stuff out. Everything's still broken. And uh, I remember I went to my, I had a mentor at the time and I just went to his house in tears. It was just like, what do I do, man? Like, I, I like, this is too hard. This is too hard. And just to like, just to land the specific warehouse story, like, yeah, is there a lesson there? No, it just sucked. And then we figured it out and we're fine. And still, <laughs> ful fulfillment is the hardest thing that you'll ever do in e-commerce. It's the worst thing. And like so much of my time and energy is still in that. Like, should you not have just paid somebody to like do some of the things that you thought you could do yourself? I mean, I, no? so if I were doing it again, and we did do it again, we immediately then started on another warehouse. We've got like 200,000 square feet of warehouse in there now. And, uh, and we, so I, we immediately started on this other one and, uh, and we, we paid a guy, a consultant to come in and design it and place all the stuff and pick the flows and do all that stuff. And like, I mean, really, really the lesson out of any, out of any business person's experiences, start using the leverage that you've built so that your life gets easier. Right. I've got an assistant now oh. and she does a lot of, you know, and I, and like, <laughs> then you, you, you have enough money to hire consultants, but when you're bootstrapped, I think you, you don't feel like you've earned your way into a lot of that stuff yet because we didn't have enough money to pay like yeah. my mother a decent wage. And so why would I ever think we could pay somebody to come and do this? And, and I had to do it all myself. And so like the lessons learned are just leverage. It's, it's using the assets and the knowledge and the skills that you've built over time to do this. It's the hard part about starting a company as a 26 year old schmo that doesn't know anything is like, I had no leverage. I had to build it all up through these really hard moments, but yeah, that, that would be a hard yeah. moment. The other hard moment where I felt like I failed was the, uh, was actually when I, when I stepped out of the day to day of the company. Cause like I was, I started at 26 grew it. This company grew really fast and got really big. And soon I was managing hundreds of people, but I wasn't a great manager. I'd never been managed in a, in a big thing like this. I didn't know what you're supposed to do. And so what I built was an organization that was a hundred employees that were all extensions of my own hands. And I would ask for like daily reports, like, what'd you get done today? And I was trying to keep tabs on if you were working hard enough, cause I wasn't going to get screwed. You're not going to take advantage yeah. of me. And so I found myself just exhausting myself, micromanaging and being a really crappy leader. And, uh, and so the, you know, like that, that moment where all of a sudden you find yourself like you're yelling at people and you're not normally a yeller and you, you know, you, you start lobbing bombs back into your business to blow it up so that you still you're needed and you're good at fixing these things. If, if it's broken, everybody see how needed I like how much they still need me. And, uh, and what you should be doing is being very comfortable working your way out of your own position and spitting in your chair for a couple of months, having nothing to do, and then go do other big stuff. But I wasn't there yet. And so like that was, that part really, really broke and was really hard emotionally. And, uh, and my, my fix for that is I went like, you know, scaled myself up emotionally through, uh, through some coaching and, uh, and therapy and stuff like that. And then, um, for me, the outcome was I, I, ended up needing to step away from our company uh, from the day to day. And we hired in a CEO and, uh, and my job became to support him. And I had to learn how to now be a good governor to manage the manager. And eventually I'll learn how to be a good owner who manages the governors who manage the management. Um, but I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> and so we're still working our way through that. But like, yeah, those are, those are, the, those are the scary ones that I think of when you say, well, it was a hard moment. In a minute, the lightning round, including the most fun you can have in Hamilton, Missouri, if making quilts is not really your thing. That's the end of the ads. Now we're going back to the show. Great. Okay, let's do a lightning round. Give it to me, man. I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Um, what's the best thing about working with your family? Um, uh, best thing about working with my family, I think is just having, uh, having a very common thing that keeps us pulled together as we all get older, right? Like, like most, most families, I think it's just turns into Sunday dinner if you're lucky. And, uh, we, 
we still put ourselves in a room and try and be creative and come up with great things and solve problems and stuff. And that's, that's really fun to me. Worst thing about working with your family? Uh, you got to fire them sometimes. Have you fired, have you fired family members? Yeah. I fired my little brother. He wasn't showing up. And so then his sweet wife of three little kids calls me crying. And my mom calls me and says, you did not just fire your brother. And my pride stands up and says, absolutely. I did. And, uh, you know, when it's hard, man, because like, uh, he actually came back and, and we figured it all out. He, he worked with us for a decade. And it's great. How has being a YouTube quilting star changed your mom? Uh, very sincerely, I would say, I would say anytime there's any level of fame that comes into somebody's life, right? Uh, you, you start to shift some of your inputs of validation and that's a challenge. Thankfully, she's got a great heart and is very willing to like go back to center with me. But, uh, but she gets really used to people clapping for her and telling her how amazing she is and how great she is. And, uh, and that'll change somebody. What is one thing besides going to Hamilton and buying quilting supplies that everybody should do when they go to Missouri? Um, let's see. What's something everybody should do? Come and ride some motorcycles with us. We play motorcycle soccer at the 4th of July celebration every year. And it's maybe the most fun I've ever had in my life. How many quilts have you made in your life? I am working on my second. <laughs> if everything goes well, what problem will you be trying to solve in five years? Well, the big, I think the big one, the big one that weighs on me in five years is what do we do with this company? Right. And it's, uh, I mean, the options are IPO. How cool would it be to IPO a billion dollar business in Hamilton, Missouri? Um, or, or sell it to some private equity folks that are going to maximize profits and, and, uh, who knows what will happen to the town or do we keep private and, and, uh, just live off our fat EBITDA checks that will, will turn this thing into just being a cash cow and generate money. Um, and, and there's different weights that come with all of those, right? Like if I hold on to it and never cash out, like I'm great at buying low, I'm bad at selling high. And so I like, I worry that, you know, did I try and ride this too long? I think, I think in five years, that's what I'm staring at and saying, mom's, mom's 65 now. Like she, she doesn't want to wait for another 20 years to get a payout. Like, what do we want to do? And how do I, how do I represent everybody's interest and help us all feel like we accomplished a thing? I think that's the big one that I'm trying to solve. This is, this is like the hardest thing I've ever tried to solve. And I think anybody that's sold a company has probably started the same thing. And, and very few people, I think, I, I don't know. A lot of people regret it. A lot of people regret selling and, and sort of letting, I think if I sold the company and, and all of a sudden the town, like they move out of here and it's all a ghost town and vacant buildings, it's not much of a legacy to leave. So I don't know. I don't know, man. It's it, this is a this is a very real one that I don't exactly understand how to solve yet. What's your mom think, dude? Uh, my my family my family is, is fantastic because they love me and they say whatever you think, Al. Like like you know, if I gave mom a million dollars tomorrow, she is pumped. She's pumped, you know. And I'm not trying to create a million dollars. I'm trying to create hundreds of millions of dollars. And so, uh, and so most of the weight of that is sort of, is sort of set up and felt by me. It's not, it's not for mom. There's no right answer. This is, yeah. this, it, it's a nightmare one because if you're right, everybody loves you. You did a great thing. Your life's work is, is preserved and the legacy is enshrined. And if I'm wrong, it's a huge disaster, I'm a big dummy. I ruined my family's outcomes and mine. How could I? It's the worst. Welcome to the life of family businesses. Even when you win, you feel like you could still lose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 100%. Al Doan is the executive chairman of the Missouri Star Quilt Company. Today's show was produced by Edith Russelo, engineered by Amanda K. Wong, and edited by Robert Smith. I'm Jacob Goldstein, and we'll be back next week with another episode of What's Your Problem?